Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the ongoing series of Central Region webinars. And uh, today, Josh Bustad and Phil Schumacher will be speaking to us about the impact of different microphysics and the boundary layer parameterizations on storm scale diagnostics and convective allowing models, or CAMs. So uh, without further ado, Josh, it's all yours. Thanks, John. I guess I'll just get started here. You covered the, uh, the intro pretty well. This is a project that uh, Phil and I have been working on for the last couple of years, and uh, we're nearing completion. And so uh, these are the results that uh, uh, we have obtained. So a little background. Um, certainly convection allowing models um, can provide us the opportunity to forecast severe convection several hours prior uh, to development, and, and this has been shown in several recent uh, studies. Um, this can be uh, up to 24, 36, even 48 hours in advance. Uh, certainly reducing the risk, uh, though, um, to severe convection not only requires accurate and timely warnings, though, but also advance notice of the threat um, of severe convective weather. And this is especially important overnight when most people are, that aren't shift workers are sleeping and uh, Certainly that risk uh, for tornadoes was shown to be increased overnight in that paper by Walker Ashley back in 2008. So our study, we, we kind of did a two-part study, um, and this is the first part that I'll present, and then Phil will present the second part. What we did is we identified isolated uh, significant nocturnal supercells. We weren't looking for mesoscale convective systems, ratios, or, or any well-organized uh, convective system. We were looking for more isolated supercells in a nocturnal sense. Uh, and what we mean by significant is golf ball or larger hail and wind uh, greater than 65 knots. Uh, we then separated that database into two different categories, one that had supercells that produced hail and wind, and then uh, another, another database that, uh, of supercells that produced hail only. We then created system relative composites uh, using ruck analysis data to determine if there were differences in a pre-storm environment uh, that could help determine if the nocturnal supercell was going to uh, be capable of producing both wind and hail or if it was just mainly a hail threat. We used the Mann, Whitney, Wilcox, and Ransom test to determine uh, if these differences in the composites were statistically significant. And you can see in the image there to the right, uh, our general study area encompassed uh, the eastern part of the central and northern plains. One thing that we noticed right away is the hail-only events uh, were shorter in duration. Uh, over a quarter uh, of the hail-only events seen there in the blue uh, lasted only uh, 30 minutes or less, whereas the hail and wind events uh, tended to last much longer, uh, with some of them lasting uh, several hours. So using that knowledge, we wanted to see, um, in a storm-relative sense, um, how far downstream these reports um, lasted. And so what we did is we took uh, each supercell, and for the first storm report, uh, we, we placed it on Omaha, Nebraska, which of course never happens. We don't get convection here. But uh, for the case of the study, we did that. And then you can see there in the left, in the blue and the red, the hail and wind cases tended to extend, extend further downstream uh, into Iowa. Um, whereas the hail only cases, although there were a couple of them uh, that extended farther east, um, most of them were clustered uh, right there near that, that first report. The general motion of these systems was generally east-southeast, which was important for us to know when we were looking at uh, the system relative composite. So when you look at all the system relative composites that we created, uh, there was, uh, and then we looked at the statistical testing, there was really only two things that really jumped out at us that were statistically significant. Uh, one of them was a low level jet. And so the star in the two top images is over Omaha, Nebraska, and it's uh, the location of the first report. And so then you can see the placement of the low level jet seen here just at 850 millibars. And in the hail and wind cases, the first report tended to occur on the western edge of the wool of a jet max. And then subsequent reports downstream were in areas where there was even greater wool of a wind. 
In contrast, the hail-only events tended to occur on the nose of the Louisville jet and moved downstream, not as far, into an environment that didn't have uh, as strong a Louisville jet. At the location of the first report, and especially downstream, these differences proved to be statistically significant, as you can see in the lower right image. The other difference was the Louisville lapse rate. Now, these are not lapse rates that you would expect to see during the, the afternoon, during the convective season. Um, but overnight, these lapse rates uh, proved to be statistically significant. Again, you can see in the hail and wind cases, we had steeper low of a lapse rates here in the 0 to 1 kilometer layer than in the hail only cases. And this was especially true as well downstream, as you can see in the statistical significant test. So we wanted to take those results and, and ask ourselves, given these differences in the uh, pre-storm environment that we identified, can convection allowing models uh, provide us useful skill in, in forecasting these differences 12 to 24 hours in advance. And not only that, but was that skill, if there was skill in the models, uh, dependent on what type of microphysics and or planetary boundary layer scheme uh, that we used. Now it's important to note that our goal was not to determine which parameterization was best, but just what was the impact if we changed the parameterization. So we took a subset of our larger databases and the modeling work on those cases. You can see the location of those cases in the, in the red squares and blue triangles on the right. So just to show kind of an example of what we're talking about, I think a lot of operational forecasters these days use the SSEO to forecast convection. And so this is just a overview of the models that are included in the SSEO. And we can see here on the right that we have a variable PBL and microphysics schemes. So do varying these PBL schemes and microphysics schemes have an impact on what the SSEO shows? So to give an example, this was a, a June 3rd event across uh, portions of the Central Plains um, that produced quite a bit of, of severe convection in Nebraska, Iowa, Missouri there. And this is a 24-hour forecast of just four models from the SSEO. And we can see that there's some placement difference in the location of the convection at forecast hour 24, but we didn't want to concentrate so much on the placement of convection, but the differences in the uh, intensity of the convection uh, that you can see there in some of the reflectivity. But that not only uh, includes reflectivity, but extends to uh, things such as updraft helicity, 10 meter wind speed, and maximum updraft uh, within these supercells. Now in the SSEO, I'm not able to show uh, individual model runs, but you can see uh, the, the tracks within the SSEO of the individual supercells, especially in the updraft helicity and the max updraft. Um, and so there's, there's differences in intensity in the, in the tracks of these supercells from the different models. And so the big question for us was, are these differences in the convection allowing models meteorological or are they model generated? And Bill uh, will finish the talk. As Josh said, um, what we're doing here is we want to look at whether um, differences in, in an ensemble of convective allowing models are due to initial conditions or meteorological or whether they're due to the model physics. And so, so what we did is we set up the model. And everything on this page is consistent with all, every model run that we did. We did 110 model runs. Um, total over, over the last couple of years, and it's, needless to say, it took a little bit to do it. Um, our grid spacing was three kilometers. We had 45 vertical levels. Um, we had a moving horizontal domain that was 1,500 kilometers by 1,350 kilometers. And so we essentially would center the domain to the west of where the first report was or, so that you could, so that the short wave coming in would, would be resolved early in the, in the model solution. Um, then we had the typical DUDIA and RTM, long, short wave, long wave radiation. Um, a little bit different, we used the CFSR as our initial and boundary conditions. And the reason we did that is that the NAR gave us real issues. Sometimes it was missing data, um, and sometimes its analysis of the boundary layer wasn't very good. So we talked to Bob Rosmalski, and he suggested trying the CFSR. And it was fairly successful, for, um, we thought at least. Um, the version of the WARP ARW that we're using is 3.11, so it's a little bit older, but I think the point we're making still um, is there, even if, if the model has changed a little bit. Now, as I said, we, and Josh said, we did 11 hail only and 11 hail and wind cases. And all our simulations started at 12Z the morning before the convection, 
and ran for 30 hours, which would be 18Z the next day. And the time we're focusing on is between 2Z and 14Z. So um, the parameterizations that we used, we had a control, our control run, or what we call our control run, which was basically we used the ACM2 um, PBL scheme, which is kind of a hybrid scheme between a local and non-local PBL scheme. Um, and then we used the Thompson double moment microphysics. Uh, and then what we would do to kind of vary each one is we would keep the, the control boundary layer scheme and change the microphysics, which would have been, in this case, WDM6 and Morrison were the other two microphysics schemes we used with the ACM2. And then we used the Thompson double moment microphysics with the YSU and the MYJ PBL schemes, which should be familiar. They're the same ones that are used in the FSEO, or at least were last year. Um, and then to kind of understand the differences between the convection, what we did was we examined the hourly maximum reflectivity, the hourly maximum updraft velocity, 10 meter wind, 10 meter wind gust, and the min minimum downdraft speed, or the maximum absolute value of that downdraft speed. We would find the hourly max over the entire study area, which I'll explain in a little bit, and over the whole 12 hours between 2Z and 14Z for each case. We also did find a maximum area coverage as well, um, although we're not really going to show that um, today. Um, and then we tested if the differences between the hail-only cases and the hail and wind cases between these 12-hour maxes were statistically significant to see if that actually these differences were meaningful or if they really just it looked like they were there, but really it's too random. Um, just to let you know as well, one of our hail and wind events never well did not produce convection in four of our five simulations. So when we look at updraft helicity or we look at um, maximum re um, well, up, um, downdraft speed, it's not included in terms of getting our range of parameters because no convection actually developed in order to figure out what the environment could support for updraft helicity. So just want you to make aware, you aware of that. Um, then finally, just to explain what our study area was, what we did is we went to the SBC page and we plotted all the reports between 2Z and 14Z for the storm we were interested in. I was there would be a few more storms there, but we made sure that these reports we were, that we circled here were actually from the supercells um, that we were, we were interested in. And what we did then is we would find the, the report that was farthest west, farthest north, farthest east, and farthest south. And in this case, um, there's only two reports, that's because there's one report that's the farthest northwest, and there's the one report that's the farthest southeast, so it's kind of fortuitous there. And then we would draw a box around that, those, those reports, and that would be kind of your storm area, or your, your report area. Then to take into account that the model's not going to be perfect in the location, what we did is we expanded that box by two degrees in all directions. And that's that solid line box right here. And that became our, our study area box. And that would be the area where we looked to find whether there was, what the maximum hourly reflectivity, updraft velocity, et cetera, was within that box um, between 2Z and 14Z. I just want to note that, um, again, Josh showed their study area went to 100 degrees west. The largest re the report could only go to 100 degrees west. We would allow the box to go as far west as 102, as, as in this case here. Um, just because, again, to deal with some of the uncertainty in model, model forecast. Because we weren't looking for the perfect forecast and location. We're trying to see if it could forecast the general evolution of the convection in the general area where convection actually occurred. So you're going to see lots of box and whiskers plots um, from now on. Um, what this is, is in red, it's the distribution of the maximum reflectivity over the last, over the 12 hour period for all the hail only cases. And so you have the control, the Morrison, and the YSU, MYJ, and WDM6. So, um, and you can see the bar is the median value, and then the thread is represented by the, the whiskers here. And we do the same for the hail and wind cases, and you see control more. So they all have the same name. They all, there's 11 in each one for maximum reflectivity. Um, and then what we did is we test, compared the same group. So control, we compared control to control, Morrison to Morrison, et cetera, and we tested whether there were statistically significant differences. So that's what you see in the table down here. And first of all, what we did is we calculated the overall mean for all 22 cases for each, for each distribution. You can see that on average the maximum reflectivity was generally in the upper 50s dBZ. Again, this is simulated reflectivity 
um, over the area. Then what we said is, if you define severe weather as being re reflectivity greater than 50 dBZ, which I know is rather crude, was it, did it catch that there would be severe weather that's in, within the study box? And what we found is generally over 80% of the time, it would have predicted severe weather. Um, then we split it up between the hail only and hail and wind cases. And when you do that, you can see that, again, the values for like the control, the Morrison, et cetera, for the hail only cases generally had lower median DBZs than the hail and wind cases. And that shows up in the fox and whisker plots too. Yet even though they were lower, still over 80% of the cases would have been flagged as being potentially severe if you used a threshold of 50 dBZ for the hail only cases. And over 90% of the cases would have been flagged as being severe um, if you use that threshold for the hail and wind cases. And that was that one case that didn't produce convection was the only one it missed. Um, when you compare the, the distribution between the two, the hail and wind and hail only, we found out that in all cases, um, the, the hail and wind has statistically significantly larger maximum reflectivity than the hail only cases. So actually, if you knew the climatology of the model and you saw the DBZ value, the storms were stronger, you could have a better sense that hail did supercells in this area would produce hail and wind instead of just hail only. So the next one we checked with was updraft helicity. And um, again, same kind of thing. And what comes out first of all is it's strikingly obvious that the hail and wind cases have much larger updraft helicity than the hail only cases. Um, in many cases, it's the maximum value from any hail only case is generally less than the median value for the hail and wind case. So it was strikingly different. Again, if you use the SOBASH at all, 35 meters squared per second squared as a as a proxy for severe weather, you can see that not quite as good as max reflectivity, but generally still over 75% of the time, um, it plagued these, these cases as being, these 22 cases as being severe. And when you break it down between hail only and hail and wind, hail and wind has the same distribution or the same probability that we saw with the, with the max reflectivity. So with the stronger or these supercells that are producing both hail and wind, um, the updraft helicity is very good at picking out that there, that that has a potential to occur. Nin over 90% of the time, it flagged as being a severe storm um, in that event. Um, with the hail only cases, it's still over 50% of the time. And for the control, Morrison and MYJ, it was over 80% of the time. But the YSU and the WDM6 um, parameterizations tended to perform a little bit worse in terms of, of having high updraft helicity. Um, but still, it's still over, almost two-thirds of the time or better. So overall, it, it provided a decent forecast, not quite as good as the hail and wind case. Um, and then if you compare the, the median, the distributions of the hail only and hail and wind, um, you see the means are very different, which comes out of the box as well. The p-value, again, is less than 0 0.05, um, in several cases less than 0 0.01. And so again, the differences in updraft helicity between the two different um, types of storms is statistically significant. And given the same parameterization, stronger storms, stronger supercells produced by the model, or stronger updraft felicity produced by the model is more likely to produce both hail and wind at night from a supercell. Um, then we decided to look at wind speed, uh, 10 meter wind speed, and realized this is somewhat of a diagnostic out of the model. It actually it predicts the lowest boundary layer and then drops it down to 10 meters. But it was the best we had in terms of getting hourly data. <clears throat> and in this case, we could actually start looking at whether it could differentiate. The first one's really tough, whether it could determine whether it was going to be severe weather or not. Now we're getting to the point where it's determining not only is there going to be severe weather, but is there going to be hail only with these storms or hail and wind with these storms? And so that's what we're doing here. And so we have the distribution of wind speed here. You can see in general, the hail only cases had lower maximum wind speed than the hail and wind cases. Um, but it's not quite as good as before, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, when you look at, at it, now we're looking at the percent, I'm going to skip the first percent correct and go back to it later. If you say the percent correct here for hail only, what we're looking at is how many times did it not pre predict wind less than 20 meters per second, because we don't want it to produce wind. And when you use that, you see the Morrison um, parameterization does the best. 82% of the time, the hail only cases did not have strong, greater than 20 meter per second or greater than 40 knot winds with them. But when you 
you get to the MYJ and WDM6, then in those cases, um, over half of the cases, or less than half of the cases, actually do not have strong woods with them if you use a 20 meter per second threshold. On the other hand, for all the cases for hail and wind, well over half the cases produce um, winds greater than 20 meters per second. So, um, so it actually was giving you indications. If you used just a single threshold, it would tell you that that wind was likely. But more importantly, I think, um, is even in cases where it did poorly, such as the MYJ, in terms of keeping the value under 20 meters per second, the difference between the, meet, the, the distributions of, of MYJ over here and the MYJ here with the hail and wind was still statistically significant to 0.01. So even though it was overestimating wind speeds, potentially with the hail only cases, you still get much stronger winds with the hail and wind cases. So if you knew the climatology, you still say, oh, OK, I see there's you know, 25 plus meters per second wind speeds it's probably going to have wind damage with these supercells, whereas if it's only around 20 or 21 meters per second, it may not. The only one that was not statistically significant was the WDM6. Um, in both, you can see the, the means were very close to each other, and if you look at the distributions, they overlap quite a bit. And so the, it's not, the WDM6 was the only parameterization that could not differentiate between hail only and hail and wind cases. If we go to 10 meter wind gusts, it's exactly the same thing. Um, it, we use 20, if you use a 25 meter per second threshold for wind gusts, which is 15 knots approximately, you can see again that several of them, just using that single threshold, does not do a good job of predicting that hail only cases would not have wind. But if you know that the comparison between the two and compare the distribution, hail only cases still have much lower wind speed um, than the hail and wind cases. And so the, the, there are statistically significant differences in, in four of our five, except for the WDM6, where there's very similar and very strong, actually, um, wind gusts associated with those cells. Um, finally, if you look at um, downdrafts, um, and the reason we chose this is we thought this might be an indication of how much momentum was coming down and how rapidly it was approaching the surface and was more likely to break the surface nocturnal inversion, perhaps. Um, and when you do that, um, that also is fairly, you can see that the downdrafts were generally weaker with our hail and only cases as compared to our hail and wind cases. Um, generally, the p-values were 0.05 or less, with the WDM6 having the weakest um, significance. Um, but you can see in general, um, minus generally, downdrafts less than minus 10 were most common with um, the hail and wind cases. Um, we did not put a threshold here because no one's really established what severe weather or wind speeds would be associated with a, a maximum downdraft. So um, you maybe derive that from the cases, although I would think that 11 may not be enough cases to actually set a threshold. But I think the point being that stronger downdrafts are produced in the model for cases that are going to produce severe winds, where severe winds were observed with supercells. So lastly, what I want to show is um, the uh, evolution of, the, of different uh, parameters. And what we got here is basically the hourly maximum reflectivity in the upper right, the hourly maximum updraft helicity in the lower left, and the hourly maximum wind gust in the lower right. And we plotted it for, this is for July 14th, uh, 2010. It was a really massive severe weather outbreak overnight in North Dakota, uh, probably one of the best uh, hail and wind cases we got, um, actually. Um, and what I found interesting, or what Josh and I found interesting, is that Generally, the reflectivity was pretty similar. I mean, Morrison's always lower. Um, but if you look at the trend, the trend is very similar between them. But when you go to updraft helicity, you see that different parameterizations peak at different times. Uh, for instance, the MYJ peaks very early at, at 5Z and then has a second one at 10Z. But the YSU peaks uh, around 7Z. And if you go look at Morrison in the control, that's around 9Z. And uh, the WDM6 peaks is reached between around 10Z. And so it's interesting that even though the large, what I would consider the mesoscale evolution, the storm itself is fairly steady state in the reflectivity in terms of maximum, where the, where the helicity is strong, it varies markedly depending upon which, which uh, parameterization was used. It can really show the difference. And, and I think that's because the parameterizations here are starting to control the storm scale a lot more. The reflectivity is probably controlled much more by the mesoscale, which was relatively well forecast. But when you get to storm physics and storm evolution, that these, these parameterizations probably have a, an even bigger effect. And I think that's why you're seeing differences 
and when different mo different models or parameterizations are peaking, how it's updraft velocity. Now, in this case, all of them produce really high updraft velocity. It never gets really low, um, but it can be different. In, a in other cases, you know, you can drop below 50 and then back above again at different times. And if you look at wind speed, it's similarly, there's generally a similar trend. You see a peak, it, you know, from about 5Z to about 10Z in all the models, the exception being the Morrison, which has its peak much later in the morning um, than the, or in the night than the other three. But again, you see that the storm scale differences may be driven somewhat by the model. So it may, we didn't check how well it did on timing at all. Um, but it does bring in the question whether there might be issues on different parameterizations may produce convection at different, or make the convection most severe at different times. We look at a hail only event. Again, you see a similar thing. In general, the general evolution of the reflectivity is similar, or max reflectivity is similar. The control ramps up a little bit slower, but they all show that the reflectivity starts low and increases as we go through the night um, on, in this event. But again, the updraft Catalicity, it, it can be a lot different. You can see the MYJ has peaks at different times. Um, it rapidly, MYJ and NYSU go rapidly above 35 or 50 meters squared per second squared very early in the night, whereas it takes the control until almost uh, 11Z before it reaches that point. And the Morrison is kind of in between, and uh, WDM6 are kind of in between those two. And you see the wind speed, the same thing. You see peaks earlier with the, some of the models and peaks later with others of the models. So, so there does seem to be differences in the microphysics that the PBL team and microphysics can have on the storm evolution that, that makes it important really to understand what the model, what is creating the model. And also, I think, and we'll talk about this a little bit in a little bit, impact if you have a multi-physics model running um, or ensemble running in, for CAM. So in conclusion, hail and wind events had a longer duration than hail only events. And um, I think that may partially explain why you get when you're able to evolve the the cyclone for a longer period of time. It's more apt to be able to get the wind down to the surface. Um, supercells associated with hail and wind events developed on the western edge of the 850 millibar jet maximum. Um, supercells associated with hail only events developed at the nose of the 850 millibar jet. I think again, because the it's it's on the western edge of the jet, it's actually going into air air that we're um, more unstable air has been invected in in the hail and wind cases. And hail and wind events were less stable at zero to, in the zero to one kilometer layer, although as Josh pointed out, it's still pretty stable in that layer even for the hail and wind events. Um, I think the biggest thing that I was happy about is CAMs do have skill in differentiating between hail only and hail and wind events. Even though it didn't look like we got a lot of differences in the composites, those differences are enough that, the, that convective alive models can tell you whether um, there's going to be whether wind is a real threat with, su again, this is with supercells, and I, I should say that frequently, actually. And for each set of parameterizations, there were statistically significant differences between hail only and hail and wind, with the exception of the 10 meter wind speed and wind gusts using the WDM6 uh, microphysics scheme. So that's, I think that's great. I, I think it really gives us hope that, you know, running a camp 24 hours or 36 hours out, we can actually tell the type of convection evolution in some of these, especially in these more extreme cases, hail and wind being much more destructive in general than just hail by itself. Um, again, at least with supercells. Um, and in most cases, the qualitative trends in reflectivity, especially and somewhat in wind, were similar, although the magnitudes vary. Um, and updraft velocity we saw varied much more over time than the other two. Um, Updraft velocity and reflectivity were able to identify potentials for severe storms. The POD was approximately 90% when using a 35 meters square per second square threshold or 50 dBZ. Um, wind speed and gust threshold to determine the risk of damaging winds resulted in a high FAR when looking at the two. And you really had to know what the differences were between the two to set a threshold. The threshold vary, would likely vary depending upon what your microphysics and micro and boundary layer schemes were. So <clears throat> what's the impact for us as forecasters? Well, the number one impact is, is we, we, they, these can be really useful, um, CAM can, for helping with nighttime convection, at least for supercells, in determining if wind is a threat along with hail. I think that's a huge help. It's something you can message early in the day um, in social media, on your, on your HWO, et cetera. And you can also plan staffing. I mean, so it, it's a huge help for us. Um, 
But I think one thing that it does have an impact on is that as forecasters, we need to be aware of the parameterizations. And, and probably at some point, there needs to be some sort of model climate developed, similar to what's been done with the gap um, in, the, in the medium term that you can get off the Western Region Situational Awareness page. We have to be aware of the parameterizations being used. And why is that? Well, it's because if I look at the control here, I can see there's pretty big differences here between the control and um, for wind speed um, between hail only and hail and wind. But if I if I have two, another set another model that instead of being a, you know having the same parameterizations and in different initial conditions has the same initial condition but two different parameterizations, I can end up having almost as large of a difference, even though they're both predicting a hail and wind event. And so. So we need to be aware of what the parameterizations are, and we need to help from other people who can run the model much more faster than us to develop a climate. And I think the other thing is, is we start talking about ensembles and neighborhood probabilities, that, that, and if we have an ensemble that's varying model physics, such as the SSEO does, then we need to start thinking about bias correcting these parameters, these, these, these like updraft helicity, to take into account these differences that are due to model physics itself and not due to the model initialization. That's all I got. Phil, Josh, thank you. Uh, that's some great information. I uh, appreciate your continued work in these areas. Uh, some really good stuff going on there. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you soon, and we will have the recording online. Take care. Bye-bye.